If you want me to be honest with you, I wasn't scared of going to prison at all. If you were, if you think I was worried about Los Muertos and gangs, I wasn't worried about anything. My biggest concern was not smoking weed and not being able to sleep. Because for years, I was sold on the idea that if I didn't smoke weed, I couldn't fall asleep at night. And dog, if I didn't have weed, I could not fall asleep at night. So are you seeing what I'm getting to? So here's the fucking deal. So I always smoked weed. It took me about 10 days when I got to prison to, I, you know, I was telling, I, I don't know, on the early podcast, I think it was one with Bert and one with Felicia, I said a joke that if you think people talk, if you think black people talk in the movie theater, go to prison. That that makes, I mean, black people yell at movie theaters, African-Americans. If you go to prison, they talk all fucking night. How did I know that? Because my first two weeks in prison, I didn't sleep because I had no marijuana. So I would just lay there on my tin fucking bed all night and hear, Jerome, what's going on? Nothing. What's happening with you, brother? Nothing. I, what, you know, it was constant all night long. They're yelling from the third floor down to the first floor. If I had weed, I wouldn't have heard that shit. So, but I didn't have any weed. So that was the first uh, whatever that I had. So as soon as I got a prison, you know, one of the roughest things for me was being in the halfway house and not being able to smoke weed. And once the switch went off, and I said, I realized that I tested positive for touching the Coke, and I realized that I tested positive because I was a junkie. I couldn't stop snorting. Once I did get it all in the control in the halfway house, don't get me wrong, I would roll a joint. I would roll the skinniest fucking joint you could imagine. And I had a punching bag, and I had weights. I had like a regular, you know, uh, Inclined bench, cheap Kmart, little fucking thing. I think I paid 35 bucks a month rent for the garage in Boulder. And even when I was at BCTC, the halfway house, and even when I was on community corrections, I found a way to go to that gym. I would light the joint and just go and take one hit off it, blow it, and turn the joint off. And then I would punch the shit out of that bag till I was covered in sweat. My shirt would have to be covered in sweat for me to fucking finish the workout. But I swear to God, for nine months, I pissed in a bottle doing that exact same thing twice a week. I would smoke a little bit, and I would keep my level just the same so they could never, ever say, well, it raised or whatever. Because they give you a couple extra whatevers. I don't, I'm not going to say milligrams or centigrams because there's going to be some smart guy that's going to say, Joey, you're wrong. It's this. And I know it is. I don't know the exact wording of it. But when you take a, a, a piss test or a drug test and the results come back, they give you a natural amount of THC to have in your body. Because maybe you weighed a poppy seed bagel. Maybe there's a lot of things that will give you a negative read for THC. I don't want you motherfuckers in probation now to go to your probation office and say, well, Uncle Joey said that if I eat fucking poppy seeds, I test positive. And I, and listen, I'm just telling you that there's a bunch of little things. I don't know exactly what they were. I'm using poppy seeds because they were one of the ones when I was in there. This is 87. God knows what does it now. But there were certain things that gave you a positive for opiates and marijuana, and one of them was those fucking things. So you have to keep it under a limit, and that's exactly what I did for nine months. I stayed in the halfway house. I was like the fucking star pupil of the program because I had turned it around. Little did they know that I was still smoking pot only under a certain level. I risked going back to prison for fucking four fucking years for smoking pot because I cannot smoke pot. That is a sad individual. That is something that's sad. That I would go to somebody who has a child and say, hey, you can't smoke pot, but if you do, they're going to put you back in prison. I found a way to smoke pot and not go back to prison. Am I proud of it? No, not at all. 
but I'm just letting you guys know that it was wrong. When you have a family, you cannot do drugs and think that it, it just didn't work. That's why I lost that family. That was the big difference between this family and that family. That's why I lost that family because I was still getting the fuck high. When I became a comedian, show me a comic that doesn't get high. We are broken people. We're broken people. When you look at a comic, he's broken. I don't care whether you look at Dave Chappelle. I don't care whether you look at Anthony Jeselnik. I don't care whether you look at Joey Diaz. I don't care if you look at Bill Burr. I don't care if you look at fucking Cat Williams. Something in our wiring isn't right. Either we didn't get enough attention as children. Something ain't right. We saw something as a child. And I'm, hey, listen, I'm here to admit it. Who knows what it is? Who knows what makes you go up and talk in front of people? And if you notice that every comic has a crutch, whether it's drugs, alcohol, sexual, we all have something that is over the fucking top. That's because we're not normal people. If you're a comic, put that in your mind and understand it. You know, the great Rudy Sarzo once said, when it comes to musicians, comics, actors, it's a thin line with the mental health disease. It's a very, I know a lot of comics that, you know, have mental health problems. A lot of them. A lot more than you may think. You know, for example, my son, you know, there's a lot of us that have mental health problems. Some of them, I'm free to discuss their mental health issues. Some of them don't know they have them. You know, I didn't know I had them. We all think we're fucking stronger than death. We all walk around thinking there's nothing wrong with us. And there's plenty wrong with us. I, I raised my hand. I'm number one with this, you know. But for fucking a year since the pandemic started, I've been crying anxiety to you guys. And I went on a fucking roll with those fucking little football Vikings, those fucking things. And I, th that was my answer to it. But I knew deep down inside I had to get to the root of this fucking problem. I just couldn't blame it on the pandemic and fear. Something was not right here about my behavior. Something had led to that. 